you very much. Uh, now, we have had a very interesting session, and uh, we agreed to postpone the discussion till the end. Now we are coming to that level. Our first term uh, speaker, Professor Dr. Andreas Kimchiel, spoke of very interesting topics of Internet of Things and machine-to-machine -machine connections and out-of-the-box thinking, evaluation of different proposals. We know it's very, very difficult at times. And the research methods description. Uh, and also, we, was, uh, we, were, we are fortunate to have had a little description of Hamburg University of Technology. Our second speaker, uh, engineer WDS Vijay Pala, um, he mentioned to us about the population growth, and um, we were com carbon neutral till about 1850, and um, we started using fossil fuels, and we are polluting at an alarming, uh, alarming uh, pace. We are fortunate to have it from the chairman of the Ceylon Electricity Board, who are the biggest polluter in terms of coal consumption, I think. Nobody else is using coal. So we have had that. Hmm? And um, we also had Professor Dr. Michael Hahn about mobile mapping, laser scanning, navigation, platform, 3D point clouds, handheld scanning, simultaneous localization and mapping, indoor and outdoor applications, road inventory, uh, with diagrams and figures and uh, pictures road condition mapping, building information, modeling. And the last speaker, Professor Rahul Atalage, spoke about this very neglected area of buildings and uh, about the energy into buildings and uh, pollution inside buildings. If I remember right, it, see he said it can be 2.5% higher than outside. And uh, he also mentioned that even perfumes can be creating this pollution. So if there are any ladies, this is the time to <laughs> target him and ask why, why perfumes can pollute buildings. So I leave it to you all to raise any questions at this stage from any of the four speakers and uh, to join in the discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. I am Commander Mahagadhar from Navy. I would like to forward these questions to Mr. Anurag no, 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 Pala. No, 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 no. Thank you very much for your comprehensive and timely presentation. As an eminent and influencing person in Sri Lanka, in the engineering field, what sort of action you have taken in your organization or uh, in Sri Lanka to reduce the carbon, di carbon dioxide dioxide emission, and what are the policies and regulations in Sri Lanka to regulate ca carbon dioxide emission, and are those enough and viable? Apart from that, are we going in par with other countries following the regulations like in Asia and Europe? Thank you. We give you a name and uh, whatever place of work for record purposes. So I am Commander Mahagadhar from Navy. I am a marine engineer. Sri Lanka is a small country. And if you compare our electricity generation with the international or the world's electricity generation, it's a huge difference. So our annual electricity consumption is 12 terawatt hours, 12 terawatt hours. Whereas the world electricity production and consumption is 20,000 terawatt hours. So what we do here, by burning fossil fuels or whatever, has a very little effect. But nevertheless, CEP has taken many uh, steps in this, this, in this regard. Today, uh, we generate electricity, 10% of our electricity, using 
renew uh, small scale renewables, what we call the new renewables. But if we take the all together, including of a la large hydro, of course we don't have very large hydro, medium sized hydro, our 50 percent of our electricity is generated using uh, renewable options, renewable sources. So that is a very fair amount. And of course, still we have a target of going further, and we have given many concessions uh, to the private sector to develop uh, renewables and to join in the, the renewable sector. And as CEB, we are just starting a 100 megawatt uh, wind power plant in MENA, uh, which will be completed in about uh, two years' time and will be connected to the national grid. Therefore, we are uh, very heavily on the green path. Any other question? I, I forget if there were any other. Thank you. Sir, we have uh, measures to measure emissions of vehicles. But uh, we don't have, I, as far as I know, we don't have any measures to emissions of factories and uh, power plants. So how do we measure the emissions of those uh, areas? Uh, of course, the emissions of all power, uh, the major power plants are measured. There are online me measuring methods now. For example, stacks of the Norochuali power plant are continuously monitored with online measuring. But of course, small scale power plants, small power plants, they don't have online measuring. But you can always estimate what are your measuring, what are your uh, emissions by uh, estimations. For example, we know by burning one kilogram of coal, we produce one kilowatt hour. So we know how much coal is we are burning and so on. So of course, the national emission levels are therefore either uh, rather than through direct measurements, they are estimated. Therefore, all over the, uh, the country as well as the world, we have fairly accurate uh, emission measurements or estimations now. So the national, therefore, IPCC has a special inter intergovernmental panel for climate change has a special uh, group called the uh, their fourth uh, uh, group in their in structure, which maintains national uh, emissions inventories. So they maintain for every country what are their national greenhouse gas emission inventories. I hope I made some uh, uh, clarification for you. Right. Thank you. Sir, Any further points for discussion, please? Sir, good evening. I am Squadron uh, uh, Leader Kumdu Amravadana, retired from the Sri Lanka Air Force. Uh, so this qu question is again for you, sir. For a fact that uh, uh, in the generation plan of the CEB, it's the least least cost uh, option that you follow. That's why we go for the coal from 2011, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, now I see a drastic improvement of coal implementation in Sri Lanka. However, we have a national energy policy uh, target as well. Anyway, uh, plus. Uh, 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 unlike in past, now wind has becoming a uh, competitive uh, uh, renewable sources. But, I mean, it's going to be very cheap in the uh, coming years. So, uh, and as a matter of fact, the pilot project uh, of wind uh, we have at Hambantute uh, area is now, uh, to my knowledge, it's, uh, it's unserviceable. And uh, what will be your uh, input, I mean, as CEB on these issues. Of course, uh, our least cost generation expansion plan has many coal power plants to come because that is the, the, the cheapest at the moment in, uh, as far as the power generation options are considered. But at the same time, we, uh, we have our government policy has a uh, uh, poli committed policy of going for 10 percent of our electricity uh, by 2020 uh, and going even further improvements. So, so on this basis we have identified 375 megawatts of wind in the MANA area. But unfortunately we can't uh, 
develop all of them uh, to, uh, at the same time because of the limitations in our grid, grid's ability to absorb them because we are an island. So being an island, if we have 375 megawatts of uh, uh, electricity coming from wind power plants, when the wind is not, and we, we don't, uh, we, we replace by, uh, by wind one of our coal power plants. So we don't build the coal power plant. Instant, uh, instead of that, we build the 375 megawatt wind power plant. But the moment the wind is not blowing, our 375 megawatt power plant will come to very low output. Then somewhere we will have to switch off, which is not acceptable to the people. So therefore, we have to make sure uh, whether we use renewables like uh, we, we, uh, wind, we have sufficient capacity elsewhere to meet the demand when the renewable source is not available. I, it may be solar, it may be wind. Therefore, we are going into these renewable sources like wind and uh, solar and all that very cautiously. So that we make sure that when you go home and uh, press your switches, you have electricity rather than uh, Notice from CEB saying wind is not blowing, right? So, so we make sure that the reliability of the supply is there. But uh, nevertheless, we are going for renewables uh, uh, as much as possible. So one, one more thing, sir. Uh, now the oil refinery in Sapugaskanda, it's almost 45 years or so old. And uh, uh, it's not been renovated or been modernized yet. And uh, it's, I, I've heard that uh, when we, we have only about 60% of efficiency on that uh, plant now. So uh, why don't we go for that? I mean, it's, it's a waste of uh, yeah. resources. I'm, I'm not the right person to answer that because uh, uh, that is not in my purview. But uh, from my knowledge, what I see is that the government had a plan to re uh, rehabilitate that uh, refinery. Because even at the moment, we import, I think, uh, about 50% of our refined oil. So diesel, petrol, refined oil, we import a lot now because the refinery capacity is not available. And on the other hand, it is not efficient enough. Therefore, what you say is correct. And therefore, the government has plans for uh, rehabilitation of it. And of course, they had a joint uh, inspection of this issue with the Iranian government, but unfortunately with the economic embargo on the Iran, they couldn't invest on this. Therefore, there was an issue. But I think the government is working on this. Thank you, sir. Right. So, excuse me, can I ask another question from Professor Atalagi? Okay. Sir, uh, uh, now we have that uh, Green Building Council, Council in Sri Lanka. We have the G Green Building Council in Sri Lanka. and. Uh, I've not seen much more work. Uh, I mean, uh, it's not been established. It's been established, but the work output I, I have not been seen rather than cer certifying the buildings for this uh, uh, lead certification and all. Uh, to, uh, just to uh, make aware, uh, would you please uh, tell me that uh, what else uh, does the Green Cou Council building uh, in Sri Lanka does? Same as I, I don't represent <laughs> the Green Building Council, uh, Sri Lanka. Well, what I understand is uh, just uh, a general remark would be that generally all across the world um, there is a trend for demanding for gr green buildings. That means it's not only from a perspective of energy, it's uh, uh, optimally uh, used resources like water. Uh, energy, the land, then the how it is integrated, the building is integrated with the surrounding, and also the Indo uh, environmental perspective that is uh, conducive and optimum for the occupants. So all put together would be the green building scenario. So all countries have embraced this. Uh, lead Leadership in energy and environmental design uh, launched by the U.S. is the most uh, prominent uh, internationally. So, as an example, Sri Lanka has about 13 LEED certified buildings. So, in that per perspective, Sri Lanka building, uh, Green Building Council also emerged. But I think they have not done adequately from a perspective of uh, green building 
rating and certifying. So they need to, in my opinion, they need to have a, a more efficient, effective platform. So I don't want to comment more than that. Um, but the tr trend is that across the world that uh, all buildings would be moving towards grid building and especially commercial buildings where they will have a competitive advantage of they are producing goods and services will have a tag that would be indicating that so this has been produced or the service that would come from a green building where the building is supposed to be in uh, harmony with the surrounding and resource optimum. So I don't want to comment more than that. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, I'm I am K K Y W Pereira. Um, again, the same thing uh, that I uh, focused. Mm. You said 2.5 percent extra pollution inside it, it buildings. Uh, no, it's not 2.5 percent. 2.5 percent. No, it is two to five times the indoor. Two to five times more polluted than what you can find in outdoor. So we generally focus on outdoor pollution because of the automobile emissions, etc. But if a building is not properly designed, not properly addressed, if it's uh, the occupancy, it is not designed to match its occupants requirement, it can be two to five. It's quite often, especially if you go for these classrooms, uh, laboratories, etc. if you take measurements, we have found that it is much higher than the, so usual carbon dioxide levels expected is about 800 ppm, right? Uh, that's the standard kind of thing uh, from health uh, perspective. So if you take measurements, uh, if it is not properly designed, it can go up to about sometimes 2,000, especially in industrial, this uh, apparel industries where a lot of people are put together, the cinema halls, the, uh, so that can be not in residential, of course it's ventilated, especially when the buildings are done for uh, people to get, uh, people to congregate, and when they are air conditioned. To save energy in cooling, we tend to minimize the outdoor air coming into the building and therefore the interior con uh, concentration tend to go up. In addition, the generation of pollutants by materials like furniture, carpets, paints, and also the cleaning agent, the volatile com uh, organic components like these acetones, things like that used for cleaning, cleaning of uh, furniture, the floor, tiles, etc. All this, these get added to the interior environment when the, the the outdoor air, fresh air that is brought into the building is not adequate, concentrations can be very high. In addition, I said that body perfumes, etc., all these are volatile components that would be added to uh, as body fluids into the indoor environment. So it's, it can be two to five times, that's what it is. Thank you very much. Yes, um, I'm Vipula uh, Beiratna from uh, Department of Special Sciences. Yes. question is going to Professor Atalagi. So, in fact, uh, thank you very much uh, for your interesting presentation about building simulation. So, uh, you, you, you are trying to simulate uh, many things uh, in relation to the building, like uh, the weather conditions and thermal conditions, uh, air conditioning. And uh, are, you, uh, are you proposing to simulate everything simultaneously or separately? Uh, That's the question? Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, if it is uh, Simultaneously, uh, uh, can we find uh, uh, enough uh, computational powers? Because uh, if you try to simulate everything in simultaneously, the computational power is the major constraint. Okay, understood. Thanks. Uh, can I answer? Right. Yeah, it is even because building it's it's an integrated system. It interacts with the interior, people, equipment, etc. It interacts with the outside, uh, the uh, the surrounding air. Yeah the sky, etc. So you cannot isolate because true, to get the true picture, it has to be simultaneous. Uh, engineering point of view, it's a simple task. Oh, wrong. Okay. It's a task. It's a manageable task, right? Computer power is a challenge. But adequately, most of the, the even the tallest building in the world, the, a normal computer with, with bit of power, above average, can handle the software has been uh, so nicely developed.
that it is optimized, that it can handle the, even the tallest building uh, in the world can be simulated uh, in an integrated manner. And uh, you can, I think one, one of the staff members in, in KGU ah, is doing a similar task. Of course, it is challenging, but it is not an impossible task. Uh, it, it, but the rule is it has to be an integrated thing. Otherwise, it, it doesn't uh, make sense. I think there's a question from Professor Han. Yes, uh, I would like to forward this to Professor Han. Uh, solving exterior orientation parameter for a single image is well known to photogrammetry. We know it, how to do. And uh, when uh, a mobile mapping device is uh, used, so probably we may be having thousands of picture frames. So are we, what, how are we going to, uh, I mean, uh, which kind of algorithms that used for uh, solving in EOPs there, or are we using some different kind of algorithms in order to solve that? Or maybe we still we use point-based or feature-based or some other algorithms? I'm not sure whether I really got your question. Was it on? Yeah, uh, solving exterior orientation parameter for a single image is very well known. for the question. Uh, the question was that, uh, you know, if you have now mobile, f if you capture images mobile, then you capture, of course, thousands and thousands of images in a short time. And uh, this orientation stuff through resection or similar techniques, of course, uh, is developed. But how does it work if you have this much images? Um, basically, it's like this, that you use, of course, the dynamics now of your movement. So you, you use the information that you are able to predict where is your next location where you took a photo uh, so you know roughly very well where you are and uh, this is then this idea that you have some information about 3D you must solve the correspondence problems to the image and then you can update your your exterior orientation as we call it also so it's a princip in principle it's the same algorithms they work within what we call a Kalman filter solution to solve that problems. But in principle, it's still the same basic algorithms behind it. Any further questions before winding up? No? I would like to ask a cl clarification from Professor Andrews. Now, people sp speak of Internet of Things and machine to machine communication and so on. And uh, s some of the younger people might understand this very well, but uh, to me they are not that familiar. Can you explain by this, uh, what is meant by this? The question was what the Internet of Things and cyber physical systems and machine-to-machine -machine communications are all about. <coughs> so I think what we see is that we have the generation um, of human-to-human -human type of communications. We have human to uh, the Internet type of communication. And the next dimension is um, very much related to what we have seen on the other sides here. We have seen the, the home, which gets to be more and more smart, to be more energy resilient. So we will have an in interconnection between the cyber world, which is our IT world, and the real world, which we call cyber physical systems. And um, the Internet of Things is an internet which is connecting the different devices and sensors. So one, one of the examples is very nice, this home, which is being modeled by you. And the home will have 
in the future many, many sensors and many, many actuators. And they need to be interconnected and they need to communicate. So if you want to think about this room here, you would have to have maybe a sensor for each of the windows, seeing if it's open or closed. You might have to want to see what the temperatures are inside, outside. If you want to open them, you might have actuators opening and closing the windows. With that, you could you reduce the amount of um, cooling energy you need, for example. You might want to have temperature sensors all over the space where you to do and how to, to make them communicate. And this is what we have called machine-to-machine -machine communication or also Internet of Things. And this goes beyond um, this, the building. It goes to the city. It could be bridges, water canals. Um, you would um, detect flooding in time that you would change um, the way the water flows, for example. You could think about um, the same thing in production. Then we call it Industry 4.0 in Germany, the fourth generation of industrial production. And if you go for um, yeah, um, for cars, for example, it's the cars communicating, but also the parts on the car. The tire could communicate to the rest of the car, and that's what we all call it enough things. Yeah. On time, and uh, uh, therefore, uh, I think the discussion is over. Now it's another. Uh, ceremonial part that the computer can take over. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the engineering plenary session. It is time to sum up the session. Now, I would like to invite Professor K. K. Y. W. Pereira, the chair of the session, to present tokens of appreciation to the presenters. Engineer Andreas Tim Girl. Mr. Anra Vijaypal. <laughs> Professor Michael Hahn. Professor R. A. Attalage. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to invite Rector of Southern Campus of General Sir John Kotalawal Defence University, Brigadier Lal Gunasekara, to present a token of appreciation to the chairperson.
थैंक यू वेरी मच